I am going to answer your questions that you guys asked in my Q&A on Mastodon. My name is Henry. I've been working with privacy and security for years here on TechLore, and let's dive into the questions. First question is from Matthew. I know Discord is a nightmare for privacy. What are ways to have more privacy on Discord and what should we look out for? I think Discord's privacy concerns fall into two buckets. So the first bucket is just raw data that you optionally give to Discord when you send a message either in a DM or in a public server or when you join a video chat or when you join an audio chat or whatever. And that's being collected and there's really no avoiding that. You just have to acknowledge that there's no end-to-end -end encryption on Discord. The best way to mitigate that is to just be aware of the issue and use things like Signal if you want more privacy on that front. The second bucket, we do have some things to do. And this is more of the stuff that happens around your messages. Things like the browser you're using or the operating system you're using, your IP address, telemetry data collection. The first thing I'd recommend in that second bucket is to avoid installing the Discord native clients on any of your devices. That means on your desktop, use the web app. On mobile, just try to avoid using the apps if possible. From there, make sure you enable 2FA on your account, ideally TOTP. Try to have an alias email if possible. If you're lucky, see if you can set up an alias phone number, though I doubt they'll accept it. Make sure you have a strong password on your account. And you can toggle those superficial privacy settings off as well, though like we covered in our Discord video that covers its privacy concerns, it's pretty superficial at best. The last thing I'll say is that if you're using something like Brave or if you're using something like uBlock Origin, you can actually manually disable some of the telemetry that Discord does. There are things like open source Discord clients that you can interact with, but proceed with caution, you might get your account banned. Next question is from Kai. Most custom ROMs, which are like variants of Android that you can install, are not an option in my country due to compatible devices availability, and Apple is too expensive. Do you have any tips for someone trying to de google -ify? weird word, while being stuck with Android. So there's not much to do because Google Play Services is this proprietary black box that's found on pretty much every Android device outside of maybe some custom ROMs. Try to make sure you're disabling anything you can in your settings and disabling permissions and disabling features you don't need. Try to swap out Google services for non-Google services when possible. There's a lot more minor tips that we can give here that you can find in our Android privacy and security guide. I'll leave that up there and down below. There are deep loaders online that you can use, but I find these to be a little bit inconsistent and sometimes they can even open up stability issues as well. I would recommend to just accept the situation a little bit here and do the best that you can on the phone that you currently have and then down the road see if there's a better option for you. Up next, Green Man 36 what would be the quickest way to improve someone's privacy and security? The way I like to break this down, especially for new people, is you have security, which enables privacy, which enables anonymity. For people brand new to this world, normally we start them at just basic security because most people don't do basic security. Normally my first place I start with people is having a safe place to communicate. So that means something that's end-to-end -end encrypted. I almost always use Signal. From there, it's normally about the browser, so people have a safer browser. And Brave normally is a really nice selling point for me because it's like, hey, you already use Chrome. Brave is based on Chromium and it works just like Chrome, but it's just better and more private. If you can get people on end-to-end -end encrypted platforms that are safe for them, like Signal, if you can get people to better browsers like Brave or Firefox, I think Brave is easier to transition to. And if you get people to use 2FA, you're already doing fantastic. From there, you might be looking at your password manager or especially aliasing and things like that, but I'd say those three things are normally where I get started with most people. Several questions from Gene. The first one, what were some of the toughest things for you when you started on your privacy journey? Honestly, probably the absolute toughest thing for me both back then and today is the nature of this. People, it is extremely difficult to live the privacy and security life that I wanna live when I'm literally constantly uploading to YouTube. I am in a very happy place with my privacy and security journey, so go me, but I've had to make so many sacrifices to get here and there's still a lot of things I wish I could do that I feel like I can't do because it would go against my current threat model. This actually was pretty much that whole why I moved to stock Android video back in the day and this happens all the time behind the scenes back here. I'm constantly engaging with tools I'd rather not engage with, but I also can't really imagine not doing this content. And so I just do my best to navigate that road as best I can. And again, I'm really happy with where I'm at and I found a great middle ground for myself. Next question from Gene, what were some of the mistakes you made along the way that you wish you would have known about beforehand? Two things, one, complexity and two, sustainability. When I say complexity, I'm gonna give you a story here. So we used to use the Adobe Suite for our content. Not anymore, Adobe's trash. Now for those who don't know, Adobe doesn't offer native Linux support. I didn't wanna use Windows at all. I told myself I hate Windows, I don't wanna give Microsoft any data. So pretty much I experimented with all these different Adobe options on Linux. You know, I tried Wine, I tried just generic VMs and eventually people in my Discord community helped me set up. By the way, thanks to all of you, I ended up actually successfully setting up this GPU pass-through configuration. It was a mess, it took 
like days to get it set up and also like some arch updates just completely broke the VM. The amount of time that I poured trying to make that configuration work was time that I could have put more content out for you all or I could have made other improvements to my privacy and security journey that would have been a lot more impactful. And so from there on out, I was like, okay, no more BS that requires 50 workarounds. That ties into the second point of sustainability. If you're relying way too much on complicated solutions or things that are super inconvenient, that's not sustainable. When I'm looking at people's privacy and security journey, especially when I'm doing coaching or consulting with individuals, it's more about, okay, how are we going to make these changes so that you can have like a real realistic, sustainable privacy and security journey when we're done. The second part of sustainability is it's not just about me, it's about services that I'm using. So I'm not going to name names, but I used to use certain services back in the day that were run by just people, you know, maybe in just their house or their basement after like six months, they, they just disappeared. And I already moved all my data into those services. I completely became dependent on those services. And you know what? Those services actually were pretty awesome and they gave me awesome privacy and security perks, but there was no really team behind it. When you choose to engage with a service, do you want to engage with a service you're going to have to move away from in six months? Or do you want to choose something that's going to be around in five years? So make sure you're picking things with public teams that have a solid history and ideally have some kind of money or method of staying alive that you can trust or get behind. And up next, I hope I say this right, oh, aquas, aquas, not sure, I'm sorry. Um, how can I ensure that my social media profiles are secure and not exposing too much personal information? So we're gonna start with the basics here. So make sure you're trying to use alias information when possible. So with Facebook, try to use something like simple login to hide your email. Make sure you're using a password manager and you have a strong password and make sure you have 2FA, ideally TOTP. And I'm pretty sure some social media accounts nowadays have things like YubiKey support. So if you have support for hardware keys, use that. Doing those three things puts you well ahead of the majority of people. From there, make sure you're going into the privacy settings of each of these programs. Even if they're superficial, you can still disable a lot of things within each individual social media site that you engage with. From there, just like Discord, keep them off of your devices. Please use web apps. Did you know you can use Bumble in a web app? Did you know you can use Duolingo in a web app? Did you know Apple is about to make web apps even better? People, you can even use Snapchat on your desktop via its web app. There's definitely a time and a place for native applications, but guys, seriously, web apps are super powerful for your privacy and security. Keep this crap off of your phones. Keep this crap off of your computers. Okay, I actually did miss a very critical word of this question, which I do want to quickly touch on before we move on. You said, how can I ensure that your thing is private and secure? Um, I actually really encourage people to try to break into their own accounts on like a fresh browser window. So try to see what information you can gather about yourself from your profiles with this fresh browser window and pretty much try to break into your own life. If you have a trusted friend or someone else, um, ask them also to do it so you can get a second pair of eyes. And that's a good way of like just quickly checking to see what the average person might be able to gather about you. Next question, future geek. Do you think blogging under one's own name is a privacy and security concern at all? Is using a pseudonym better? Well, yes, from a privacy perspective, using a pseudonym is almost always better, but um, if it's a concern is totally in your court, and this is why we talk about threat modeling, we have a threat modeling guide, go watch it. Um, what threat modeling is, is you have to decide what are your concerns in your privacy and security journey, and what are you going to do pr to protect yourself from those concerns. For some people, using their public name online for a blog or whatever is an absolute no-no. For some people, the whole blog has to revolve around them. Maybe you're like a professional NFL player and you need to share with people like your own personal journey of being in the NFL. To answer your question, yes, from a privacy perspective, using a pseudonym is almost always better than not using one because that's inherently more private, but just because it's inherently more private doesn't mean you inherently have to do it. Next question is from Meow. Linux laptops are a little hard to find, so while buying a laptop, what are the things I should look for if I'm going to only use Linux? Man, I'll tell you what not to look for, and it's anything that has to do with NVIDIA. Oh, NVIDIA, fuck you. I know it's been getting better over the last few years, but honestly, having to use Linux with an NVIDIA graphics card several years ago, I've, I'm done. To share my own experience here, I purchased three laptops and not one of them did I do research on before I purchased them on whether or not they were Linux compatible. I just assumed they were. And all three of them were compatible with every Linux distro I tested on all of them. But if you're really concerned, you can probably just go online and type a quick search of the laptop model or maybe the brand or a similar model to see if it's compatible with a Linux distribution. Also, pro tip, buy things with some kind of return policy because then if you buy it and it doesn't work, you can just return it. And if you like this content, check out Go Incognito, which is our course that takes you from start to finish on the privacy and security journey. The goal of the course is so that you leave with your own independence and you don't have to rely on other people. 
all so that you make your own privacy and security decisions because you have the fundamental knowledge and information to make those calculated decisions yourself. It's actually free to watch on YouTube, but if you want the premium experience, I highly suggest going with Go Incognito Premium, which comes with its own course ecosystem and you can directly engage with me in the comments and there's quizzes and other fun things there to make it a much more engaging course. Check that down in the description. And if you wanna watch a fun video, this one right here, definitely a good one. Go check that out as well. See you next time on Tech Lore.